So uh, we mentioned that the theme of gyms this year is simply this, think right and win the fight. And I'd like to just, as we kind of get into the Bible today, talk a little bit about this. Um, first thing, we really believe as a church that it is of utmost importance to pass our faith down to the next generation. Uh, we really believe it's important. We put a big emphasis here on youth and, and children's ministry. And the reason for that is our culture and our world today is just pressing constantly uh, against uh, what God would want us to do. Our world is just constantly pressing us into patterns. And some of those patterns have to do with our thought life. I, I would say of uh, our world today that it is so superficial. In fact, there's such a push to just don't think about it. Just do it. Come on, go along with the crowd. And anyone who begins to think about things, it's almost like there's an ostracization that happens. Like, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you? Another thing, uh, often uh, Christians get characterized, especially because we hold faith out, as uh, being people who don't think. I mean, if you watch about Christians in the media, Christians are often cast as, you know, fools. You know, watch The Simpsons. You'll see what I mean, right? I mean, just total dolts. Um, here's the thing. When Christians say that we need to put our faith in Jesus, we don't mean by that, turn off your mind and just believe. In fact, we mean the opposite. Turn on your mind. Think. In fact, one of the things that people just don't do enough of today is just sit back and think about life, about reality. How would we get here? What is the purpose in life? Why am I here is there a God? And uh, one of the things that I'd like to encourage today is that we just think, which is one of the things that we've been doing all year with our girls, uh, asking them to think right. Think about what's true and right and noble and good, what's lasting and substantial and secure. So instead of being kind of apathetic and superficial, which our world just wants to press us into, we just want to encourage everybody who's here today to really think. In that line, I'd like to ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Oh, there we go. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verses 24 through 27. You can find that on page 686 if you're using one of our church Bibles. A little bit about this passage as you're turning there. Um, these few verses are the conclusion of a sermon that's probably Jesus' most famous sermon. It's a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you can find the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew. If you've never taken the time to read it before, I really encourage you. We're not going to do it in this service, but I really encourage you to take some time and really go through it. Uh, you know, if, if you have any regard for who Jesus is, these are probably his most famous words, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, read through them and just consider what it is that Jesus says. We're just going to today think about the conclusion to his sermon. You know, he's, he's ready to drive the point home. And uh, these words, by the way, are probably uh, familiar to most. They're, they're very famous in the Bible. I'm going to begin reading in verse 24, and I just remind you as I read that uh, we now are about to read God's words. And these are the words of Jesus himself. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had it, its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on a sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So um, these are the conclusion. Uh, this is a conclusion to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And here he points out that there are two different builders who build two houses on two different foundations. Uh, the wise man uh, is the one who hears Jesus' word and put them into practice. Jesus says he's like a man who goes and when he builds his house, he builds it on a rock. And uh, when the winds come, when the rain comes, when the streams rise, that house stands firm. Uh, Jesus talks about a fool who goes to build a house. He builds it on a much different foundation. His house is built on sand. And uh, this fool has at least two problems. We'll talk about them more. He, he's first short-sighted. He doesn't consider the future, what might happen 
down the road. He's also naive. He does not consider reality. He, he just, maybe because it's convenient, maybe because it's easy, he builds his house in this easy place, but he doesn't take into the account the wider realities. Like he has this bubble that he's put over himself. He's decided not to think, which is why Jesus says he's the fool. He builds his house there, not realizing that the rains are going to come that the wind someday is going to beat against it, that the stream is going to rise. And you know how the song goes, like maybe if you were in Sunday school, and the house on the sand went splat, right? Uh, I mean, some of us know that song. Um, so we've got two builders who are building two different houses on two very different foundations. I'd like to draw your attention, and I just hope you keep your Bible open as we, we read and study together, to the very first word, of verse 24. Uh, this is how Jesus gets into this conclusion. The very first word is, therefore. And uh, whenever you're reading in the Bible and you come across the word therefore, you should always ask, what is therefore, therefore? You know, why is there a therefore? And in this case, uh, this conclusion comes after Jesus has some other words. And if you begin to read the words right before it, you realize that there's a bunch of what I call pairs of two. And uh, the very first one, verse 13, uh, we'll call two ways. Um, there are two different ways. Look with me at this passage, verse 13. Jesus says this. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But Jesus says, small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, only a few find it. Here's what I'm asking you to do today. Just think about things. Okay, Jesus said this, that there's only just two different roads that people are on. One of them's wide, it's convenient, it's easy. You know, given the choice between uh, driving on a wide road or a narrow road, You'd always choose the wide road, and besides everyone else is doing it. Uh, but Jesus says that road, it leads to destruction. He says, listen, there's many people on it. Just because everyone else is doing it, you remember what your mom used to say? If everyone else was jumping off a bridge, would you? Right? This is what Jesus, there's this wide road, and almost everybody's on it, like everybody's doing it. Just think, you know, what road am I on? Jesus says there's this narrow road. He says of this narrow road that it leads to life. But he says, here's the truth, there's few on it. In order to get on that road, you obviously have to go against the grain. It's not going to be as convenient. It might not be as easy. Right now, there might be a little bit of pain involved. But instead of going off the bridge like lemmings, uh, this road leads to life. And what I want to ask you today is just think. Okay, if Jesus says there's only two roads, there's only two ways, you know, which one am I on? Like it's good every once in a while to just think about these things. There's another pair uh, of two. I'll call it uh, this. There's, there's two teachers or two teachings. Look with me at verse 15. Jesus says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. He says, By their fruit you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He says, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by, your, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So basically what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, look, there, there's not only two different roads, but there's two different teachers with two different teachings, and he says it might be difficult to distinguish between them. He, he speaks about these false teachers that they have all the trappings of being true teachers. Like you may hear them and listen to them. It may seem right to you. And uh, that there's these two different teachings. And again, it might be at first difficult to distinguish between them. But there's, there's a connection here between the wide and narrow road and uh, these true and false teachers and teachings. And the connection is actually surrounding this word life. Look with me in verse 14. Jesus says, small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And when he talks about the, the good teachers with the good teaching, 
He says, look, you can think of it like a tree. A good tree is going to produce life, fruit. When you see that fruit of life, you'll recognize the bad tree, it produces no fruit. It's linked to that wide road that, that leads to death and destruction. And uh, I want you to realize, and this is important, uh, we talk about this all the time here at Sunlight. At the center of this book, the Bible, there is a message, and it is all about life. Uh, that central message is often referred to as the gospel. The word gospel means good news. This book is good news about life. Think, for example, of John 3, 16, which most of us know. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. At the center of this book, there's a message. It's about life. And uh, this is the way that you're going to recognize good teachings and good teachers. They're going to point the way to life. Why that's important? Um, here's the thing. At least for myself, um, I had to come to recognize at some point that I was on a road that was leading to death. And the reason for that is I'm a sinner. And I'll tell you, actually, it was, it was this Sermon on the Mount that helped key me into this. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, I grew up in a home where I thought I was a pretty good guy. Um, you know, I said to myself, well, I'm not a murderer. Uh, I'm not a really bad person. I mean, I kind of look around, and I think most of us do this. We compare ourselves to one another, and, uh, you know, well, if they're going to get into heaven, then I'm surely, right? Uh, but it's actually, if, if you'll turn back with me to chapter 5, it's a Sermon on the Mount that started keying me into things. And what I realized is that, you know what? God has a standard for me that is way higher than my standard for myself. And uh, you look, I won't take the time to read these passages. You can just look at them on your own. But beginning in verse 21, Jesus talks about just, he begins to talk about the Ten Commandments. He says, you've heard it was said to people long ago, do not murder. You know, I, here's what I do. Okay, I'm not a murderer, so I'm pretty good, right? But Jesus, he says, wait a second. I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. It's easy for me to say, well, I haven't murdered someone. I can't tell you that I haven't been angry with people. Or, or, or look down, beginning in verse 27, he, he talks about adultery. You know, you've heard, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. And, and many of us, what we'd like to do is say, well, okay, I think I'm doing all right there. Maybe a couple times, but, you know, it's not an ongoing habit at least, right? I mean, we'd like to say things like that. But you know what Jesus says? He says, wait a second. He says, anyone who looks with a woman lustfully commits adultery. And I think, oh, hold on. I mean, Jesus' standard is so much higher. I mean, look beginning in verse 33. You know, most of us, we'd like to say to ourselves, you know what, I'm true to my word. If I was to put my hand on a Bible and swear out loud, I'd, I'd do what I said. Most of us think, yeah, when we take an oath, when we give a promise, we're true to our word. But Jesus says, hold on. He says, hold on. You know, don't just think about when you take an oath. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I can't tell you that every word I've ever spoken, I've been true to that word. Jesus has this standard that's so much higher. In fact, at the end of chapter 5, he says, look, here's the deal. You've got to be perfect. You've got to be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And um, if you think about things, at least the way I did, I, I realize I am not living up to that standard. And what the Bible points out is that our sin is the very thing that cuts us off from God. We're all, at one point or another, and you've got to realize, I'm on the broad road. The fact that I'm a sinner, I'm headed toward destruction. And this is what the Bible points out, is that none of us, by our own effort, by our own merit, is perfect enough to live up to God's standard and merit life. And because none of us is perfect, God loved us so much. This is what he did. He sent his son, Jesus. And, and if you go back even to chapter 4, Matthew points this out. All the gospel writers point this out. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was God himself. He took on human flesh. He never sinned, not even once. He was tempted in every way, just like we are, but he never sinned. And here's why he lived that life, is so that God could take our sins and he could put them on Jesus and Jesus would be punished in our place. In fact, uh, we're coming up to Good Friday here. That's exactly what happened on the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, we are supposed to die. He took that death for us. And it's all about life. So that now, if, if we turn away from all our own efforts to make ourselves acceptable to God, 
If we turn away from that and we believe in Jesus, which means we trust in him to save us and we surrender our lives to him, then he will give us eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him is not going to perish, but is going to have everlasting life. True teachers, true teachings point out that Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is that narrow road. And true teachers and true teachings point you to that truth of the gospel. Okay, so there's two ways. There's two teachers, two teachings. The third one, I don't know. I'm a pastor of a church. I personally, I find this one brutal. Uh, But here's what uh, Jesus is going to point out. There's actually two Christians. I want you to look with me beginning in verse 21. Uh, To me, I think all of us would spend a lot of time thinking about what Jesus says here. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Then Jesus says this, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I hope you catch the import of this. There are a lot of people who assume they're one of God's children. They just kind of Blindly, they're going along with the crowd. They probably come to church every morning. They may sing all the same songs. We're all in this together. But when the end comes, they're going to hear Jesus says, I don't know who you are. In fact, there's a parable. Jesus, he emphasizes this point throughout his ministry. I'd like you to just page forward a couple pages to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, There's a parable there. And I think, again, this is one of those things we should just think about. Uh, These are words that Jesus spoke, and if Jesus spoke them, I mean, at the very least, we should consider whether Jesus was telling us the truth. Beginning in verse 47, uh, it's a parable, I think, fairly easy to understand. Uh, Jesus is talking about the church, you know, what the, the nature of the church is like. He says this, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, in order to understand this parable, I think you just got to have a mental picture here. The net that Jesus is speaking of, it's clear in the Greek, is a dragnet. And here's the picture that you should have in your mind. Um, this is how fishermen would do it. They'd have a boat. They'd be standing in the boat, and, and there'd be another boat over there, and they would have a net between them, and they would let down this net, and then the, the two boats would troll forward, and that net would just sweep everything up. Does that make sense? So like everything that's in the way of the net is going to get caught in that net. And then Jesus says, here's what the fishermen do. After they catch everything they're going to catch in the net, they're going to pull that up onto shore, and uh, then they're gonna, there's going to be some sorting. And those that are good fish are going to be kept. Those that are bad fish are going to be thrown out. He says, that's how it's going to be in the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to just think about the nature of the church. Here's the truth. Many of us, we're a part of the church, and we just think to ourselves, I'm coming up on shore, baby. I'm in. I'm with all the people. I'm going to Jesus. And, and I want you to go back to chapter, chapter 7 a second. I want you to see the words that, that the person speaks who Jesus says, hey, I don't know you. These are his words. He says in, in verse 22, Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, and I'll catch the pronoun here, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? This person does say, wait a second. Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? And and wasn't I with you? And didn't I trust in it? That's not... Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we have all these miracles? In other words, like, hey, I was a part of the church. I was in that net too. Just because you were baptized... Just because you come along to church doesn't mean you're on that narrow road. 
doesn't mean you've taken hold of the good fruit. There's two ways. There's two teachers and teachings. There's two Christians. And today, I just want you to think. Okay, uh, let's talk about this wise and foolish builder, right? Because now, okay, there's all these pairs of two. Then Jesus says, okay, now, therefore, you got to pay attention to this. Like, here's the big conclusion to the whole thing. Therefore, Jesus says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it has its foundation on the rock. And he says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, the rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So there are two different builders who are building on two different foundations, one on the rock, one on sand. And there's something we probably ought to just clear. You know, here in Florida, uh, a lot of builders are able to build some beautiful, fine, strong houses on sand. In fact, most of our houses are probably built on some kind of sand, right? Um, you got to understand some of the geography of the land in which Jesus was living and teaching. Uh, it's actually, if you ever go there, it's a very rocky place. It's hard to find just some clear sand. Here's where you find sand in, in, in that land. Um, in the dry season, when uh, it's been dry for a long time, there are these streams that dry up. And on the bottom of the streams, there is this sand bed that's left there. That if you were to look at it, it's a very flat place. All things considered, it might look like a very fine place to build a house. In fact, as you look at the topography of the rest of the land, it's hilly, it's rocky, and might be difficult to find a flat place to build your house. The person, though, that would build their house in that bed of sand at the bottom of a dried up river is a what? Jesus says is a fool. Why? First of all, he's short sighted, he just lives for now. It's convenient. It's easy right now. He doesn't think about the future, that any storms may come, that this stream bed may fill back up with water. That's not going through his mind. He's short-sighted. Uh, this person also has another problem. They're naive, which means they, in one way or another, they just bracket out reality. If you build your house on a dried-up riverbed, you have to just bracket out reality. And I think that this, I mean, if you begin to think about Jesus' words, it's, it's just so apt, especially for our culture, especially for our world, especially for today. Our culture is constantly telling us, don't think about it. Oh, come on, just do it. I mean, later, you know, later you'll give thought to what's really real and true and right and noble and good and if there's a God and whether you ought to serve him. But right now, come on, it's fun. We're all doing it just, Right? Live for the moment. It's, it's just so few and far between that any of us stop and think. What's the future going to bring? What's really real? Like, don't let anyone trap you in this kind of naive bubble where you don't think about whether this world has a God, whether I was created by him, whether I have to serve him, whether I'm separated by him because of sin, whether there's a way to get back to him through Jesus. Uh, our world is like, hey, don't, don't bother with that stuff. Don't, just come on. I mean, there's this narrow road that few people get on where they really sit back and they're wise. They begin to think, you know what? Maybe building my house here is not a good idea. And uh, what I'm asking is that some of us, we just get future-oriented. Here's the truth. If any of us are thinking to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to walk through this life, there's no storm that's ever going to come. You're being short-sighted and naive. I am telling you, the storm will come. That riverbed will fill with water. And even if somehow, by some miracle, you make it out of the events of this life, do you really think you won't face a judgment day where God is going to say, okay, I gave you all these gifts. I gave you all these talents. What have you done with them? Have you loved my son Jesus? Stop and think today. Just stop and think. Don't be short-sighted. Don't be naive. Let reality seep in. Think about the future. There are so many of us who just because everyone else is doing it, it's easy and convenient, we're building our house right now on sand. If it's you, 
If you realize, oh, man, I don't, maybe, am I? You know, it, it'd be so easy to just walk out the door. Well, that was an interesting, that was an interesting service. And just leave, right? <laughs> don't do that. We as a church are trying to get past the superficiality and the apathy of our culture, which tells us, hey, live for the moment. Don't think about things. We encourage you to think about what's true and right and noble and substantial and weighty and lasting and forever. And we want to let you know right now, there is good news. There is this narrow road. It's Jesus There is this good fruit of good teaching, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that if you will trust and surrender your life to Jesus, you will have eternal life starting right now. You don't have to be the kind of Christian who's just kind of going along with everyone else that's caught up in the net, and and you're like, oh, I'm being drug up on shore, baby, only to find out that you're going to get thrown back in. You can have eternal life right now in the assurance of salvation and know for sure that your house is built on a rock, that when the rains come down, when the winds beat against it, when the streams rise, nothing's going to shake you because your house is built on something that's secure and lasting and forever. Here's what I like to do. Uh, Again, I I just say to you, um, I think in our, our culture today, there's just, we're so busy with things that we just don't take time to sit back and think. We can get busy with so many tasks and we can entertain ourselves to death that we just don't sit back and contemplate and and think. And I'd like to just, as we conclude our service, provide some time where we just quietly, each and every one of us, just think. Just think. And uh, after some time, just quietly, we're going to do this together. I'll close this in prayer. And then we're going to celebrate together the amazing grace that we have that God's given us through Jesus. So um, let's just quietly think together and then I'll pray.